Hey, y'all. Hey, hey, how's it going? Good. How y'all doing? I don't know. I got the jitters low key. Oh, no. It's okay. Being that logging is great. You, you know, I'm trying, you know. Mm. You got Sarah <laughs> on. Oh, we love to see it. God, is I don't. Okay. <laughs> I'm weak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So good to see you, Belinda. It's so good to see you, Teresa. See you as well, Rebecca. How's uh -huh. everyone doing? Uh -huh. Like this? Or like this? Uh -huh. good. Yeah. Like this? Mm -hmm. And, uh. Hey, Carter. <laughs> Hi, I'm coming to you from the couch today because since I don't have to Facebook Live, I figure I'll be comfortable. <laughs> oh, man, comfort is key. Oh, wait. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. Is this not sign language club? Oh, my fault. I have the wrong agenda up. Thanks. Um, so sorry, y'all, but I just pulled up the Tuesday Night Live agenda, but hey, how y'all doing? Um, good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to be the host for today's and this week's Tuesday Night Live. Um, although my name is on the Zoom screen, I do want to formally introduce myself um, in case we haven't met or I don't. I haven't had the chance to meet you. So um, my name is Rodrigo Morales, but I go by Rod. I'm a junior economics major with a double minor in honors interdisciplinary studies and interpreting Spanish. I almost forgot for a second. Um, and I'm from Long Island, New York. And I would also love my lovely um, ladies to introduce themselves right after. Um, when you introduce yourself, also include your um, student involvement. So I'm the president of the Latinx Student Alliance here on campus. I'm also the treasurer of my business fraternity, Phi Chi Theta. Um, I'm also in student ambassadors. I'm on my King Tim Miller Student Advisory Board and, and also a 2020 orientation peer advisor. So kick it off, Miss B. Listen, Rod does all. He does everything on this campus. It's crazy. My name is Belinda Dye. I am a rising senior from Ashburn, Virginia. My major is intelligence analysis, and I have double minors in honors interdisciplinary studies and political science. I'm also on a pre-law track. I am the president of ASO, the African Student Organization, a member of Student Ambassadors, a member of Phi Alpha Delta, as well as a lead team member for the Student Leadership Center, formerly known as the Duke Center. Mm. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Larios. I'm a rising senior. I'm from Arlington, Virginia, and I'm studying international affairs and Spanish with a Spanish English interpreting and translation minor. Um, I'm currently the vice president for a multicultural sorority of Hermandad de Stigma Yota Alpha Incorporada, and I'm also the president of the Intercultural Greek Council this year, and I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Um. Teresa, do you want to introduce Rebecca's activity? Yeah, so we'll go ahead um, and let Rebecca give us our next activity. Right. Buenas tardes, everyone. We're back with our Sabias Que segment where we find out what we need to find out. Oui. Este va a ser un mensaje bilingüe. This is going to be a bilingual message. Mm. Sabias Que, selected by NASA in 1990, Ellen Ochoa became the world's first Hispanic female astronaut in 1991. She made history again in 93 when she became the first Latina to go to space when she served on a nine-day mission aboard the space shuttle Discovery. Sabias que the official name of Mexico is Los Estados Unidos Mexicanos, the United Mexican States. It officially became the United Mexican States after gaining independence from Spain in 1821. Sabias que in 1968, Shirley Chisholm became the first black woman elected to serve in the US Congress. In 72, she became the first black woman to run for president of the United States and the first black person to run for a major political party's presidential ticket. Sabias que, the wealthiest person to ever live was Manza Musa, king of the Mali empire in the 14th century. He owned nearly half of the world's gold and was worth an estimated $400 billion. Thank you, chicos. Back to you. 
Oh my God, I would like to be worth $400 million, billion. Oh, that is coin right there. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca, for giving us our, day, our weekly Sabias Que. Um, so now that we've had everyone kind of introduce themselves and say their segment, um, I just wanted to get into the topics and the agenda of tonight. Um, so today we'll be discussing what is like being a first generation college student, um, both from the perspective from a documented student and undocumented students. Um, in addition to that, we'll also be talking about the obstacles and struggles that we face coming into college and during, um, but most importantly, how we overcame those. And finally, um, once we overcame those obstacles, how we came into our leadership roles and you know, how we've been, been become thriving students here at JMU. Um, but before we can get into all that, I would like to just preface and um, talk about some expectations for the night. Um, so before we even get started on tonight's conversation, I do want to say that this is a safe space and a judgment-free zone. So, you know, just being mindful and respectful of one another and making sure that we're listening to everyone um, wholeheartedly, being attentive listeners. Um, I also want to mention that although we are focusing primarily on undocumented and documented student struggles and obstacles, that in no way invalidates any other um, student experiences. This is just a way to highlight ones that you may not necessarily hear of as often. Um, and just let you know that there are different paths and all paths are unique um, and they make a student, you know, the student that they are here at JMU. Um, so with that being said, Teresa, would you love to talk about our mission, um, what we hope everyone takes away at the end of the night? Yeah, so the mission for our conversation today is that you're all able to walk away with um, a different per student's perspective, um, one that you may not be familiar with, and we want everyone to embrace the struggles that they've faced because they led you to where you are right now. Um, but we also want to say that sometimes some may not face some struggles or obstacles, and that's totally okay. Um, we're all students and we have our own unique stories, which led us to JMU and, and the world today. So just to make sure that everybody's comfortable with each other and promote conversation later on in the segment, we're just going to break out into breakout rooms and we're just going to talk about obstacles that you may have faced as a student coming to college or during college. And so these obstacles can range from waiting at D Hall. Well, actually I like E Hall better, so I'll say E Hall. Um, <laughs> waiting at E Hall, um, waiting in line to like get food or trying to figure out how to apply for college in general, or maybe just registering for classes because that can be really stressful. But again, kind of just like what Teresa said, we just want to acknowledge that not everyone goes through really big obstacles or has faced anything serious, and that's totally okay and valid, but we just want to rather talk about it and learn from others and get a different perspective, and it's in no way comparing um, your trials. But yeah, so now we're just going to break out into some rooms and talk about those, and also recognize that we can go as light or as deep as you want to. Um, thank you so much for that, B. Um, Whenever we are able to zoom away, um, either one of us three will be in your breakout room and we'll, um, I just realized I said zoom away. Nice fun. Didn't even, <laughs> didn't even think of that one. Um, but I guess here's the invitation. We'll see y'all in there. Yeah. Okay, I think we have everyone back from their breakout groups. Um, so welcome back everyone. I hope you guys all had a productive conversation and learned a little bit more about everyone and their struggles. Um, before the host and I get back into our own stories, um, does someone from each group want to share about what they talked about? Um, you also, if you don't feel comfortable talking out loud or unmuting yourself, um, there's also a chat feature. So if you want to just write what you saw, um, we'll be go ahead and reading the comments. Um, so yeah, and feel free to ask questions throughout the conversation. Uh, we'll definitely be trying to answer as many as we can. Um, so yeah. Um, I can go first just to get out the way or to maybe make other people feel comfy. Um, but in my group, so I actually brought up B because she was my RA my first year. 
and I was on a hall with a bunch of other girls who were honor students and there was times where I compared myself a lot and I'm sure B remembers the times where I would knock on her door just talking about life and it was really hard to have a roommate who was having like all these opportunities thrown at her every weekend always out of town and there was a point where I thought like I was wasting my time at school and I mentioned how like no I'm not a first gen kid but I know financially going to college is a big burden that is put on my mother and I always feel like I need to get the good grades or like I'm obligated to do it because there's a sacrifice being made so I have to sacrifice things as well but thanks to B and just all the people I've met through organizations and like my leadership experience I've learned that to believe in myself more and to know like everyone goes through struggles some just look a little differently so I mean that's kind of what I talked about but also shout out to Belinda because yeah you rock. <laughs> And I got muted. Um, <laughs> thank you for sharing, Maya. Um, yeah, totally. I think one of the biggest issues that everyone, or at least I know, um, is that financial cost and just like making sure how am I going to stay in college. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for sharing. Um, does anyone else from a different group or from the same group even um, want to share? I can say something. Um, I know I expressed that, of course, I'm not, I'm a grad student and I did not attend JMU for undergrad. Um, but something that was dif difficult for me coming into an unfamiliar space where no one I knew like had any insight on was just all of the jargon that's used at JMU and all of the different, it's like, I didn't know the difference between a D hall, an E hall, an SSC, a quad all of these different things and that was a little and like everyone around me just like knew what it was and would always talk about it and I'm just like I have and it's like no one really explained it to me and so like I had to stop one day and just be like yo like what is this because I have no idea so that's something that I shared and I'm sure that is something that many other people have felt as well so yeah awesome thank you for sharing um the amount of acronyms that JMU has is kind of kind of wild um I know I teach some of my first years as an OPA like the the acronym so that way when they do get here um they kind of know a little sense and they're not saying like what is that building what is that what so um um so um Karina asked how can the JMU culture change and be more inclusive I guess from the very start just saying building names and um department names as a full to begin with Mm -hmm. um, I know a good example, even now, since a lot of students do not even know what CEMA stands for, just from the very beginning saying that is the Center of Multicultural Student Services. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, after everyone is comfortable and knows what that is, say, okay, now this is CEMA. This is how we say it. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing goes with like ECL, um, which is formerly known as, which is actually known as ROSE. Um, but, you know, a lot of people hear, what is an ECL? Where is an ECL? There is no building with that name. Um, just saying like that is the East Campus Library Rose um, and we should keep calling it Rose for respect but yeah um, talking about safe spaces um, for sure um, just making sure that people feel um, just like I said at this at the very beginning of this call a judgment-free zone and safe space where you feel like you can be comfortable in expressing what you want to say um, and all that so thank you so much for asking those questions and those comments in the chat putting it to use already I'm here for it um, so if I could just get one last person um, to share because there were three groups I believe um, yes ma'am Danielle I heard that message loud and clear yes um, we will be talking about that um, in our own stories because that is something that we, or at least I and B went through. And so, you know, um, but thank you for sharing. Um, so I guess with that being said, let's move on. Um, let's talk about um, some of the obstacles that we face and hopefully in our stories, in our journeys, something sparks and maybe you all know that feeling or um, can empathize and say, oh, wow, like I didn't realize that. Or maybe you can give your own um, two cents or something like that. So um, with that being said, um, B, 
would you um, like to start us off with what are some obstacles that you face? Yeah, so um, I mean, the topic of conversation or tonight's conversation is documented slash undocumented students as well as being first gen. And I am undocumented, but I am part of, part of, I'm a DACA recipient. So Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And that was started um, underneath the Obama administration. And basically, if you came to the US under a certain age, I believe it was like 16, um, and basically you have like a clean record and you haven't left and stuff, you basically get a work permit and a social security for two years. Um, and you have to renew every two years. But that, even that in itself opens up a lot of doors because there are people who are completely undocumented and don't have that opportunity to work legally or drive legally and things like that. So um, coming into that or knowing that that was my case um, before college, it was really hard to think about even going to university or attending one just because I was like, I don't have any money and DACA recipients cannot get federal aid. So how am I gonna pay for college? How am I going to, um, truly how am I gonna complete my parents' dream of coming to the United States, getting a better, better education and like making something of myself coming from that immigrant perspective because I am from Ghana. Um, and so figuring out what school was a good school or not, especially because on top of being I'm a DACA recipient, I'm first generation and I'm the first in my family, like I'm the oldest and all that. So I'm going through all of this by myself, um, filling out the FAFSA and like trying to figure out like, what do I even put on it? Because my parents don't know anything about that. And kind of just going through that alone, um, doing campus tours alone, like my parents did not have time because they were working. And I mean, luckily I was in um, a program called Campus in Loudoun County High Schools. And that was basically like first generation students whose parents like really don't know anything about this process. will take you on campus tours and things like that. But it was still like, oh, well, like my friends are going on campus tours with their families and I'm just like, okay, I'm in this program. And that's the only, that's the only way I would have ever visited a campus period because who would, who would have taken me? Um, and just uh, the whole college application process, calling up admissions from different schools and them not even knowing what DACA was at that point in time, because it was like, two or three years old. So I'm calling JMU admissions and they're like, we don't know what that is. And I'm just like, help, you know, like if it wasn't for my grit, truly hundred percent, I would not be here and like pushing to like fulfill my dreams. Um, and then during college, taking a gap year, I had to take a gap year after I graduated high school in 2016 because I couldn't afford it um, to come to university. Um, and then luckily like pulling on my resources that I had at JMU and finding a way to, um, come to college and pay for it, but trying to find my place here because I was like, everybody that I know just came straight from high school. I took a gap year, did some real world experience, worked full time. So knowing that like I'm in college and then four years after that, I'm gonna go back to working full time, which sucks. Like <laughs> I'm not looking forward to that again. Um, but finding my place and like having like FOMO, like fear of missing out because I was like, well, I'm here in college. I want to do everything that everybody else is doing, but it's also knowing like, I'm not like everybody else. Like I really came to school to get an education. And so trying to figure out that balance and having to focus on being here at school, but also taking care of my family back home because I'm the oldest, I kind of low key ran the household. So like, even to the point where I was like, can I even go to school because my family's gonna fall apart without me like being there and like feeling like I'm living a double life because here at JMU, um, I'm not undocumented. Um, I am a black woman that looks like everybody else um, drives and has a social security and stuff like that. Um, can go to the mall and stuff, but like back home, it's like I'm dealing with all these things going on politically with my status on top of trying to provide for my family and making sure I'm not forgetting them while I'm here. Um, yeah, so those were <laughs> some of my obstacles. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Just as, um, today night live says, just as Carson says, thank you so much for sharing the, um, the whole time you were talking, I was just like, yes, I felt that I know exactly what you're going through it. Um, and the reason for that is because, um, 
you know, especially for DACA recipients, we're always told not to disclose, like be as private as possible. It's on a, you know, need to know basis. And when you finally do find somebody else that has experienced the same things as you, it's so, I don't say fulfilling, but it's so like, oh my God, somebody knows what I've been through. Somebody <laughs> understands, like I can, when I found out that B was in the same boat as me, we spent hours talking about this. Yes. I was there and I was like, oh, finally a friend I can confide in, somebody mm -hmm. that I can go to and they know um, the struggles. Um, so I guess I'll talk about my college experience as well. Um, so before college, um, my parents did not know what a savings account was. Um, so, you know, from the second I was born, some families, the ones that are very lucky um, in that case, some have like savings account for their college tuition from the second they are born um, and their tuition is paid for. Um, I unfortunately did not have that. Um, it literally was like, okay, you're moving in tomorrow. There's like $5 in the bank account. I don't know how we're paying tuition. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, but even before that, it was just kind of like figuring out the FAFSA. And then, you know, not only all the technical terms and like how to fill out that paperwork, but if I could even... Uh, like apply for it like they always say apply for it even if you won't get anything and I'm like okay then what's the point <laughs> um and then also it's like having to translate that to my parents because as a first generation student I literally was a walking dictionary where after every little segment I'd be like do you know what this means in a different language and then have to go back and say I think it connected I don't so um I have been like the person since I was born, just translating those legal documents, just translating the English to Spanish, Spanish to English. Um, and so that in and of itself is like um, something that I had to deal with and some people I know had to as well. Um, but most importantly, just not having anyone to help. Um, as a first generation student, just not having anyone that, that can sit you down and say, this is how you do it. This is the process. This is where you should be looking. This is what you should be applying for, thinking of. Um, none of that. And that's kind of like the most discouraging part because you have to, it's an uphill battle. You have to figure everything out as you go. Um, but as uh, B was saying, like, that's what makes the college experience more worth it. Um, my parents and I always say like, no, you can get your things taken away, but no one can ever take your education. Um, and especially for, um, I'd like to say for myself and B and everyone else who's here, but like, fighting for your education is something that makes it that much more valuable valuable and worth it because you know that you wanted it and you know that it was what you truly are after and so that's um that's why i like um as hard as the process was getting here um through dac um through daca and applying and all that even having to apply as an international student even though i lived here for since i was 2 years old um i was so confused by that terminology i was like resident i mean i'm a resident of virginia um does that does that help um but it did not <laughs> um and so and then some other things that i faced when i got to college is again that financial situation like how am i going to stay here um but then also just feeling guilty of leaving home mm -hmm. um a lot of people they leave home and say oh either like i've never i'm not used to being away from home or it's that you know I've, i'm ready to get that independence but for me it was like I feel guilty like I'm the person that translate for my parents I'm the person that like I'm their future I'm the reason that they came to this country so like do I feel right leaving them like should I be leaving them should I really just be getting a job and help pay with the rent utilities and all that um should I just stay close to my family and then the other thing is like my DACA being a DACA recipient, if that expires, so does everything else. So does my debit card. So does my driver license. So does like my legal standing here. So it's like for two years, I feel good. But at the end of that second year, I'm starting to stress. And like, you know, at the end of the day, I'm thinking, oh God, okay, not only do I have school stuff, not only do I have organization stuff, my social life, my home life, but now I have to worry about, <laughs> will I be able to hold all that mm -hmm. um, in the next couple of months? So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's rough, but you know we're out here, we're thriving now. Um, we're out here. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, that's it. That's it for mine. Um, the before and during. Um, again, it always revolves around that financial stuff, and so just making sure you find somebody that helps you out. Um, but we'll talk about that in the next um segment. Um. Yeah. Thanks, Rod, for sharing. Um. Yeah. Kind of just piggybacking off of what B and Rod said. They. Um 
you know, the whole college application process was just so new to me. Like, I didn't really know, like you said, what a good school was. What would I, what was I looking for? How was I determining, like, what programs were good? Um, and also, like, writing my essays, I was like, my parents were gonna not read my essays. Like they weren't gonna be able to tell me the grammar's wrong or this doesn't sound right. So like I would go to like my one guidance counselor and I had him read it like 20 times because I was like, are you sure it sounds right? Are you sure it sounds right? Um, so I was really grateful that I had him there. Um, and also like filling out FAFSA and everything. I'm grateful that my high school like offered these like sessions at night. So I would like drag my parents down there with me. Cause I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't wanna mess up and like, I don't want my parents to like blame me for it because I'm the one that's supposed to be doing it, you know? Um, and then also, like you said, like touring schools, like I never did that with my parents. Like I only went to tour schools because I was part of a group called United Minority Girls and it was basically like helping um, girls um, get into higher education and stuff like that. So that's the only way I toured schools. Or if my friend was like, yeah, I'm going to go and I'd, like tag along with them because my parents were not going to take off of work to go take me. Like, it was really difficult. And like, not that I felt like, I almost felt like alone because, you know, my friends would go with their parents, but like my parents have never visited me. Like the one time they came to see me at JMU was to move me in and that was about it. So it was kind of just like, you know, a little sad. Um and then like getting here to JMU, it was really difficult because I came from a really diverse high school. Like, you know, the white people were in the minority. So it was different, like coming to JMU. And when I was in my dorm, I was like one of two Latinas. So it's like, I went from being surrounded by people that looked like me to going to a place where I would walk around campus and not see anyone that looked like me. And mm -hmm. I talked about this in my small breakout group that it was like really difficult for me. And I like called my mom and I was like, I don't think I belong here. Like, I don't think this is where I'm supposed to be. Like, I think I need to go back home. She was like, no, like, no, you can't do that. And that was the whole like imposter syndrome because I was like, I, I don't think I belong here. Like, there's no one that looks like me. Like, how am I supposed to know that I belong here, you know? And I think that what also kind of was difficult was just like finding mentors and like, you know, finding mentors that looked like me. And thankfully, one of them is on the call. So shout out to Karina because meeting her and taking her class like really helped me because it's like, if she can do it, I can do it. Like, you know, and that really helped. Um, and also, like, we also talked about safe spaces um, in our breakout group. And I think um, finding LSA was like what really helped me because it's like, okay, I know there's a percentage of people that look like me and they're doing it too. So that just gives me motivation to be like, you can do it, you can finish. And the fact that I'm here means that someone else is looking up to me mm -hmm. saying like, she can do it and so can I. So um, yeah, those are some of my struggles. Um, so yeah, Rob, you want, oh. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we'll move on to the next question. Yeah, um, uh, really quick before I, before, um, you talk about how you overcame all that. Um, just like Karina said, struggles become strengths and ultimately we do overcome them. Mm -hmm. um, also everyone, thank you all for using the chat. I'm here for the interaction and all that. Um, but right now we're about to talk about how did you overcome those obstacles um, and whether you um, didn't talk about your struggles in the chat, um, please talk about your um, what ways you went through it and what ways you overcame those so that way maybe somebody else who's still going through it can learn from you how you went um overcame them so just wanted to add a little of that but yes Teresa could you let us know how you are thriving for our <laughs> student how you overcame everything that you went through yeah so I kind of like touched on it a little bit like finding those safe spaces and you know you need to do that you know you have to be willing to go out of your comfort zone and be uncomfortable. And I think that was like really difficult for me because I was so like in my bubble those four years of high school and then coming to JMU, I was like, oh, I need to like make new friends. I need to find a new circle. I need to find new hobbies. Um, so CMS really helped that out for me, like joining LSA, becoming a member of my sorority, like really helped me find myself again. Um, also like finding mentors, finding professors that I really connected with and um, just, you know, delving into my education. And, you know, 
I have this mentality. Sometimes I have to like reflect and be like, you came to JMU to get an education. You came to get that diploma. Yeah, there are benefits of like having friends and, you know, the social life and the social aspect of everything. But like, at the end of the day, like you have to do what's best for your education and what's best for you and what's going to help like move you further along in life and you know if that means not having friends it's definitely going to take a toll on your mental health but I think for me it's like you have to focus on school because it's like I don't want to be wasting my parents money like I don't want to like if I can graduate in three years I would have but like it's just not like that um but yeah like definitely finding my safe space and um and just being comfortable with being uncomfortable I think really helped me a lot um I when it comes to me and like overcoming those obstacles and like I mean truly just like everything Teresa said like finding my community and my place and for me that was um ASO the African Student Organization um and I mean luckily I had a cousin who was the former president so I kind of like came in and kind of knew people already so it was just easier to like get into that um finding things that interested me um apart from like being African. So like at one point I did try joining that little equestrian club, but they never hit me back. But I'm gonna be there senior year riding them horses because I was like, at this point, <laughs> this, is, this is the only time I'll be able to do that for a cheap price. So let me get it in while I'm here. Um, and pushing myself out of my comfort zone, like actually going out of my way. And like when Teresa was talking, I was thinking about how she was saying like, you know, she came here for school and like at the end of the day, like she needed to focus on that and sometimes not having like friends or like somewhat of a social life is okay. And I was just thinking about how my freshman year, I came in, especially after my gap year and like kind of like being alone, like pushing out of my comfort zone to like make friends um, to the point where it didn't affect my studies, but like I definitely focused on like friends more. And then sophomore year, and I'm sure Maya can attest to this, I was all about my studies. Like, I didn't even talk to, like, half my residents. I was just like, I need to focus on school to the point where it affected my mental health and my social life was a bust. And it was just like, just this junior year, I was getting it together. And then Corona was like, LOL, try again next year. Um, but yeah, just finding my place, my people, and remembering my why and making the best out of my college experience right now also because I recognize that I'm one of the lucky ones, um, truly as an undocumented student, being able to go straight into a four-year university and graduating with a bachelor's. Um, like, it's just like remembering who I do it for, why I do it, and moving forward, like things are gonna be better. So just keeping that at the back of my head. Um, I love that you talked about um, the balance of everything. Um, something that I share with my first year students as an OPA whenever I do this little word activity um, is I want them to write down one word to describe their JMU experience um, or their first year and what they want that to look like. Um, and so when I do my example, I write the word balance because that's what college is. It's not just all academics, nor is it all social life, but it's a mix of both. Um, because if you're too into your academics and, you know, your mental health mental health might suffer um, because, you know, you're only focused on one thing, but if you're too involved in your social life, um, then your academics suffer. And at the end of the day, as Teresa and B said, we're here for our degree and our diploma. Um, but how I overcame my obstacles and struggles, um, just like Teresa, um, shout out to her mentor. I want to quickly shout out to um, the most amazing man, and he is in this call right now. His name is Jared Diener. He is the honors academic advisor. And when I tell you, he was my main resource, my point of contact, my my light at the end of the tunnel, my first my first year. Um, yeah, him and B, um, me and B, like you know, have been to his office. I have cried in his office, um, and that just goes to show that he really was there for me as a person. Um, and he wanted to make sure that I was doing the best. He pointed me to resources um, and he helped me navigate college. And I think that was one of the things that I needed the most since mm -hmm. nobody else was going to sit down and say like, you know, this is the reality. This is how it is. And so um, I'm so grateful. Um, we'll forever be grateful. Um, and another person that I also want to, you know, give a quick shout out to is Dr. Fawn Amber Montoya, who is in here. Um, you know, she was there for me this upcoming year and having somebody that looks like you um, in an office like that is like, wow, like I feel seen. Um, 
All that. Yes. Yes. Jared Diener is a phenomenal advisor. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as to how I actually over, um, besides um, Jared and all that, just um, making all those connections, finding those communities, as everyone has been saying, um, you know, you can't do this alone. Um, and so making friends with the people in my hall, finding those organizations that I felt, you know, aligned with my values, um, meeting those people that, you know, I could see in my, in my future. Um, I remember my, my parents would always say like, you don't, you'll never have true friends. Like, you know what that is, like all that. And then coming to college and everyone talking about like, these are my lifelong friends, this, that, and the third, and, you know, not knowing what it was, but now I can truly say like the people that I have met, the people that I know, um, those people are not my friends anymore. They are my family. They mean so much to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just the fact that I went out of my way, out of my comfort zone, as B was saying, to like find those people. Um, I'm so grateful. And that's how I really did it. Um, but yeah, and then the financial stuff. Um, yeah, just getting pointed out to those resources, whether it was um, what individual programs offer or, you know, outside scholarships and things like that. Everyone has the opportunity. And so just knowing that I had the opportunity was um, really what helped out and what keeps me here. So I really appreciate all that. So with that being said, um, before we get into, you know, our on-campus leadership, how we got into that and all that, I would love to turn the conversation to everyone and just, you know, just so it doesn't feel like a lecture <laughs> um, uh, from uh, three students. So, um, you learned a lot about our stories about us, how we came to college, how we are in college. Um, but I think right now I'd love to ask um, everyone um, if one person could volunteer, if, you know, y'all can blow up the chat. Um, what were some things that you were unprepared for when coming to college? Or what are some things that you did not expect? Um, and so I'll give it a second just to see if anyone, if we have a brave soul. And then I'll actually put it in the chat just in case I forget the prompt. Yeah. I'll just go. <laughs> I'm Melly, guys. Hi. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces. Good to see. Um, I think what Teresa mentioned was something I was surprised by. Just the fact that like when you go on campus, when you're so used to like diversity at home and you go into these classrooms and sometimes topics are brought up about your own community, it's really hard to be in a classroom where people are putting their own opinions, but they don't really experience what it's like to be a minority. Mm -hmm. So I think I just didn't expect those conversations to happen on like a minority, like it's just weird like even just DACA was very like talked about or anything with minorities it's just hard to hear in class when like I know everyone in the class can't relate except me and then sometimes you even have like people who look at you when these conversations are having you know and you feel pressure to talk about it but it's also like you don't know if you want to say certain things and yeah it's just hard <laughs> That's something like I struggle with my freshman year, especially. So, um, thank you much. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, it is a very uncomfortable situation where, like, something that relates to you, um, people kind of expect you to talk about it. Um, and I don't know. And from a you know, an or um, somebody that's in a lot of organizations, things like that. We call it the glass bubble effect where like people are looking in at you and like like a little fish and they're like expect you to do something and expect you to say something. So um, yeah, as Sierra says, those are great points and thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, these someone talk about um, being like really good academically in high school, but then getting to college and kind of relearning in large lectures and like drowning academically like your first year <laughs> listen I was like I was really good in high school like you know I need to get that rigor back but like wow like this is hard gen eds are hard <laughs> 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 yeah. 
I felt that um, not know, I didn't know how to study, like, because I didn't need to in high school. And then I got to college and story time, my very first test on my econ exam, I got a 10%. And I was like, oh, and this is my major. Whoa. Um, I think we need to hit the books. I think we need to start looking for a tutor, the library. So, um, you know, just, and this perfectly emphasizes that not everyone's struggles have to be exactly the same. Yeah. Um, that they don't have to be financially related or they don't have to be, you know, minority related, but they could just be academically, they could just be socially, stuff like that. So thank you, Molly, for um, that amazing point. And Megan also says that people are really quick to say, um, you'll find your place. And, um, you know, not everyone finds it immediately. Um, yeah. Some people take for some people, it takes days, weeks, months, even years to really find their place and be able to say, oh, wow, JMU is home. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me, I never really had a stable home environment. We moved every couple of years. And so, you know, I never really was able to say that like, I have a home. Um, but I knew that JMU was going to be that place for the next four years. And literally two days in, I packed my, I unpacked everything. I had my room all set up and cute. And I was like, you know what? This is home. This is home. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know my parents. Done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, no, but they called every day, so I could not forget about them. Um, so, yeah, but it does take different um, adjustment periods for everybody. Um, and even when you think you found it, some, maybe something happens and boom, you're back to like, I don't know if this is it. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you all so much for sharing that um, mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, <laughs> Jenna's are, are hard. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to quickly drop another question before we get to our last topic. Um, and that is, what are some things that you could have done to better prepare for your first semester at college? Um, now, as a, whether you're ending your first year, second, third, fourth year, um, what are some things that now looking back, you could say, oh, I wish I would have done this differently? Yeah, and I really like to hear, I, I know that we have a few like first years or like incoming um, first year, so like, yeah, definitely, please share out. Um, I might share, um, just kind of go at piggybacking off of like what Megan said, like, I think mentally preparing myself to like be uncomfortable again is like really important because, you know, this is a new space and um, just like she said, you, it takes time to find your place. And I think, um, you know, you have to put yourself out there to take advantage of what JMU offers as an institution, like socially, academically, and like, you know, student organized, like one of those things, like I was super nervous going, like, I did not want to go. And my friend was like, no, let's just go. We'll go together. And I was like, okay. And like, if I was too nervous to like go sign up for a club, like she'd go write my name for me. And like, I'm glad that I had someone like that, you know, going into college, but you know, it, it is uncomfortable and it is scary, like trying to put yourself out there when you haven't had to do that for four years. So. Um, I can also um, mention that I wish I better prepared myself to realize that I should just worry about myself, not worry about what others are thinking. Um, all my life, I had this kind of mentality where like, you know, I was just not that confident in myself. I was very, I was very self-conscious. Um, and so when I got to college, I thought all 20,000 students' eyes are on me. Like I walk down the street and they'll notice, you know, what shoes I'm wearing, you know, um, what shirt I'm wearing, if my shorts are too short because they do be kind of short. Um, but um, just things like that. And so I then realized, I was like, you know what? Nobody, nobody cares. Nobody's minding, everybody's minding their own business. And I know because I mind my own business. I have somewhere to go. I go from point A to point B. So what is, other, what, stops me from thinking that other people aren't the same mm -hmm. um and so just kind of preparing yourself to realize that you know um everyone's in their own world everyone's worried with their own stuff and just you know focusing on yourself and just making sure that at the end of the day you do things for yourself and not others um because that's um important also being more organized um i was the type of person in high school to at my at the end of the day at my locker i'd be like did i need this this, that, that does not fly in college. Um, those syllabuses are out for a reason. Um, and so just making sure I know when things are due because nobody's going to tell you when they are due. Yeah. Um, piggybacking on Rod, like definitely like, I mean, I'm in my mind your own business ministries. Like I'm like, I'm not, 
I'm not here for it. Like, I'm going to focus on me and do what I do. Um, but like, really, nobody, not like nobody cares, but like, really do you. And that's so freeing. And like, now I'm a rising senior and like, I recognize that, but that's like, truly for like life, even like, just do you mind your own business and keep it rocking, you know? Um, but I think for me, one thing that I could have better prepared myself for my first semester was definitely like, free time and like I know like people have said that but it's like I can't tell you how many times like I was like my freshman my first semester I was like oh like I already did the homework for this class like I don't need to go because my parents aren't telling me to go um and things like that and like I think Sarah Welsh is in the chat she used to wake me up before like our like 415 SCOM class like every day because she was like we're going to class and she held me accountable to that so like finding friends that will hold you accountable as well but like really like free time, like learn how to deal with it, time management. And of course, now that I'm like older or like my senior year, I'm just like, oh, thank you God for free time. Cause now I have like more things to do and like fill it up with, but like, yeah, def definitely like recognizing that free time and independency can like go, can go sideways if you don't like pay <laughs> attention to it. Yeah, um, I just want to piggyback off of that actually cause I had a point in my notes. Um, yeah, free time was, like, really weird for me, like, because in high school, I was, like, involved in, like, so many organizations and whatever, and then when I got to college, I would just go to class, and then, like, I had, like, one organization, and I was, like, I have so much free time, and I felt, like, guilty at first, because I was, like, I'm not working towards anything, like, I should be doing something, because I have so much free time, and then I realized, like, I had to reflect, and I was, like, that's why, like, I burned out in high school, because I was just, like, constantly on the move, and, like, I wasn't really paying attention to, like, my mental exhaustion, I was actually tired, and I think, like, learning about, like, self-care, and realizing, like, I need to care about myself first before I do anything else, because if I'm not mentally okay, if I'm not, like, well rested then nothing else is gonna go right so like definitely learning how to like manage your free time was really important yeah um i quickly want to mention something um in the chat megan moore says be yourself don't try to fit into groups um mm -hmm. but rather find a group that welcomes and encourages the best version of yourself i absolutely love that because in orientation something that we say is we look for people to be their true and authentic selves not somebody else or not somebody that you think um that we might want um, and so not every student is a cookie cutter student. Not everyone fits the same mold. Um, and that's the whole purpose of this conversation to realize that there are different perspectives, different paths, different everything, and not everyone is the same or even close to being the same. And so, um, and that's also how you realize who's like really there for you and your true friend because they accept you for who you are, what you bring, not what you bring after you meet them or like, you know, a different version of yourself. Um, so thank you so much, so much for putting that out there. Um, and in addition to that, we also see, um, I also see Kuda and Daniela, um, their conversations, what we just talked about, that feeling of burnout and always having something to do. Um, yesterday, my to-do list was from 9.45 to 10 p.m., you mm -hmm. know, and that felt normal to me because I'm used to a very fast-paced life, but you know, maybe on the weekends, I really do burn out. But because I'm so used to having something to do all the time, um, I think it'll catch up to me in a couple in a couple years. But as of right now, that's like the way that I can I thrive. Um, so if y'all know me, and y'all see my to do list, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Some notes are. Hmm. Yeah. This chat is really good. I see Jared, please come to talk faculty, faculty and advisors. We want to help you. Bruh. Like I knew that coming into school. But like, please take it serious because these people, the faculty and advisors you talk to could be the link and the network to an amazing job after you graduate. Like building those connections is mwah, like, get into it, definitely. Because they will help you and they'll do what they can, you know? Um, uh, something that Daniela says, um, her immediate family not understanding and, you know, <laughs> just because they don't know what's happening or she has to explain everything, that doesn't mean that they don't care. Um, I think that's so valuable um, and totally, totally true that mm -hmm. like, I have to explain to my parents every single day what a bachelor degree is. I have to explain to them what my major is. I have to explain to them how to register for classes, just as Danielle was saying. I have to explain to them, you know, how to fill out this form, why that form is needed, why I can't share my grades. Um, not that I don't want them to see that. 
<laughs> and I grade on a test that 10 percent but it's those things that um you know even though we have to explain it put in the extra mile and they don't understand it off the bat um like you said that doesn't mean they don't care that just means that they're supporting us differently um I know for me, like my comfort food is some pupusa. So, you know, even though my mom doesn't understand anything, she gives me one of those and boom, my problems went away. Period. <laughs> um, so, and eating alone, yes, ma'am, I learned that. You just put your little Netflix, your headphones in, done. Yeah. Nobody yeah. telling you anything. Enjoy yourself. Oh my gosh, it's so just, freaking. Just enjoy it. Um, and I will definitely try to find some time for schedule, um, for yoga. Um, Yes, ma'am. I'll <laughs> for that. Um, let's see. One more thing in the chat. Yes, 100%. Um, Caitlin says just going to the free fun events on campus. Um, say less. Uh, before, I even, before I keep going on that, say less, Dr. Miller. Um, yoga, I'm there. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> What's it called? So just going to those free fun events, they're there for a reason. Um, I also, I tell my first years, um, when they come to JMU, just go to all the events that orientation holds. Not just because I work for orientation, but because, you know, they're there for a reason. They're there for you to kind of like feel that college experience. Um, and also you only get one orientation. You only get one college experience. So if you're just worried about the things that you could do every weekend, um, or things that you can do often, whereas there are only things that happen once a year, once a semester. Um, I don't know, priorities. But um, <laughs> yeah, also there's a lot of free stuff. I, so the amount of free t-shirts I have, do I wear them? No, but <laughs> I have them. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Honestly, college is great, y'all. Like I am gonna miss it so much. I love college. And I mean, given this COVID stuff, I mean, no one really knows truly what events are gonna look like this semester or this school year. But like, I'm just like, dang, I should have went to a lot more things. But that's also like me being a senior and like being sad that I'm leaving. But <laughs> yeah. Don't even, don't even talk about being a senior or the G word because I will fight you. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I don't want to hear my seniors talking about that because I'm not ready. I barely, I barely dealt with the ones that just left this semester, so. Don't, don't do it. Um, all right, so the last, uh, one of the last things that we want to talk about is how we came into our leadership and how, you know, you know, quick flick, but how, you know, <laughs> Teresa is the president of the Intercultural Greek Council. Council. You had it, you had it. Oh, so close, so close. And then how um, B is the president of the African Student Organization, ASO, and how I am the president of Latinx Student Alliance. How, you know, that didn't just happen overnight, but, you know, how us students, as first generation students who never even thought about coming to college, or I didn't think about coming to college, am now in this position. Um, so I guess I'll start it off um, to end us all. Um, like I said earlier, I had a lot of like, so I was very self-conscious. I had a lot of, you know, stuff going on. I just didn't tr believe in myself. Um, I didn't see myself as a leader. I didn't think people would take me seriously, um, but that, or that I could contribute or anything like that. Um, and in high school, I was the president of the sign language honor society, but that was just the title. Um, I didn't really do anything. And I've learned that Clubs in high school and clubs in college are way different, way different. Like <laughs> these are businesses um, in college, like the way you, we'd be running things. But I just didn't think I fit in that role because I was just, it was just given to me. So I was like, I, I didn't work for this. I didn't um, earn it. Um, so when I got to college, I did a full 180. I became more confident in myself. Um, I realized that it wasn't about what others saw or thought about me. It was like my work ethic. It was what I was doing. Um, and that was the only thing that I could control because you can't control how other people think about you, um, mm -hmm. but you can control the effort that you put into things. So mm -hmm. I always say put your 100% um, into everything that you do. So that way you can say I did it to the best of my ability and nobody can take that away from me. Um, and I also got over the, the guilt um, of feeling like, you know, do I deserve this? Like, you know, should I be celebrating this? And I changed my mindset and said, you know, I worked hard for this. I deserve it. I put in my effort. My work ethic got me here. And so I should be proud. I shouldn't feel guilty. 
Um, and that goes for everyone. If you feel that you put in your best effort, then you are deserving of everything and more. Um, and so, you know, I then also realize that I, I don't do the things for the title or I don't do it for that position. I do it because it gives me a sense of fulfillment. It gives me a sense of like, wow, not only did I do that for myself, but I also did that for others. And I love seeing that change. Um, and it was so obvious when I became a frog, a first year orientation guide, knowing that I had a direct impact on 44 of my amazing first years, um, that I was responsible for that and that I directly impacted their college experience. And so it wasn't for me saying like, oh, I'm a frog, like that's awesome. It was me saying like, I feel fulfilled because not only did I learn more about JMU, but I also helped these other students learn more about the environment that they're coming into. Um, and that's what pushed me to become an orientation peer advisor. That's what pushed me to be the treasure of my fraternity, to be in student ambassadors, to just want to help as much as I can and, you know, leave a legacy here at JMU for myself. Um, and again, like I said, coming in as a first generation student, not even knowing how to apply to this school and it giving me so much to the point where I want to give back to it as much as it did for me. Um, that's my mindset. Like, I love JMU. I bleed purple and gold. Um, I came into it like, I don't know if Jamie is a place. Uh, um, like everyone was saying, I come from like a very diverse like school environment. So I saw those numbers, those figures, and I was like, I don't know about that one. But I got here and it, for me personally, it hasn't felt different. It hasn't felt um, bad. Like I just love it so much and I try to do as much as I can. But yeah, sorry, I just, I was popping off. Go ahead, go ahead, B. <laughs> <laughs> so for me in terms of coming to my leadership um positions it wasn't for me it was coming it was more about like my insecurities and my self-perception rather than like doing the job because I mean growing up I've always had like a very dominant um if you know like disc a very dominant d slash i personality um but it was more about like going through the motions because of like oh it's a title and it's given to me so like why not but then kind of just like figuring out what leadership actually meant and I remember in high school um they were doing I got nominated for like the Hobie program and I don't know if they still do it at JMU but back then they did um so it's like a leadership thing and you come to JMU for like I think a week and a half and you do that but once when I went for my interview um, the first question she asked me was, um, what makes you a leader? And I literally sat there for five minutes and I said, I don't know. And they're like, what do you mean? And I was like, I don't know what makes me a leader. Like, I'm kind of just here. And I mean, ultimately, I did not get uh, the position. <laughs> but um, like that, that still speaks to me now because I'm just like, back then, I really just like, it was just not given to me, but like, because of my personality, everybody just assumed off the gate, you're a good leader. Um, so figuring out what that meant, especially coming to JMU. Um, I mean, coming into JMU, I already knew like, oh, I'm going to be president of ASO when I'm a senior. Like I, yeah. I manifested that. Yeah. Um, but like getting to the point where I was just like, I don't want to be a president of ASO because that's the title. It's because I love it. I care about my org. I want to do the best I can for my org and having our voice there and just coming into those positions where it was just like, it's not about the title. It's about doing what you love and giving back to the community. And student ambassadors was one of the things where I was just like, yo, like the, the thing that would make me happiest is giving a tour to somebody that looks like me and them knowing that when it comes to um, the numbers for diversity and like minorities, like it's not there, but like letting someone know like, hey, like I'm here, I did this. You see a face that looks like you, you also have the opportunity to do everything and more that I did. And so like getting into that is like, that's, that's the type of leader I want to be. That's, that's what I want to um, show. And then of course, getting introduced to the, I mean, then Duke's Leadership Center and figuring out more about my personality and my, my talents and my strengths and everything that I bring to that and teaching others how to be leaders in themselves. Like, it's like, wow. Like I can, I looking back, it's like, wow, like Belinda, you've, you've come up, you've become a leader, not because of like, your personality but like truly what's on the inside and like you recognizing like this is something that you can do and like even piggybacking on rod like i deserve yeah. i deserve i worked hard yeah. i work hard for everything i do and so 
regardless, like I'm gonna I'm get that position because I deserve. I did all the work, I put in the work. And so, you know, here I am, hire me. Um, but of course that also goes into like, you know, who's grad. So, um, but yeah, definitely. And that's on lawyer. That's on future lawyer right <laughs> yes, there. Yes, you already know, you already know. Um, yeah. Um, Teresa, let us know how you became this amazing, amazing. Um, yeah, um, leadership has always been something I've always been into. Um, I've always been part of like leadership programs and you know it helped because I've always had a mentor follow me like in middle school and high school just someone who believed in me and it's just like so great because even when I didn't believe in myself it's like someone believes in me so I should do it too you know fake it till you make it type of thing um and then getting to college it was really difficult actually because you know, I had these, all these clubs and organizations on my, like, high school resume and everything, and then I got here, and I'm like, wait, everybody else has done the same thing and more, and I'm like, how am I supposed to compete with that, you know, all this stuff, and, like, you know, comparing myself beyond end, it's like, how am I supposed to be happy by just comparing myself, and I realize, you know, I need to be happy about my accomplishments instead of thinking about what other people have been doing, you know, and I think, um, also seeing like the change that people can make in their community like I remember my freshman year the LSA president Cindy Funes she well they her whole exec board um did a march against um march for DACA and I saw that and I was like I want to be on that board like I need to be a part of the difference that they can make on the community and so that's what really pushed me to um, get my first position on the LSA board and then the next year I was like you know what I can do better I want to do more so I ran for VP and you know I was VP my junior year so it was really cool just like seeing myself grow um, within my own board so it was really awesome and then also like my freshman year I pledged for my sorority um, and, you know, being around women who were leaders who wanted to make a difference really helped me because I was like, they can do it. I want to do it. Like, we all have the same vision. So we're all just going to be pushing each other to do better. And that's what I think I really thrive off of is because, like, we should all be pushing each other to do better, not to be comparing ourselves, because that's what really helps, you know. Um, and, you know, I think that's what I really like about leadership is because I'm not only teaching myself, but I'm teaching everybody else around me. And shout out to my CS sister who's on here. She's the new president. And it's like, I'm so, I'm super proud because it's like, I've done my job and now I'm able to pass it down and see what great of a job she's going to do. And that's what I want. You know, you want to make a change. You want to be able to get through this like cycle of just creating better and better leaders because that's what it's all about. Um, you know, and now becoming ICGC president, it's like, I was really nervous. I was really nervous running for the position because I was like, I don't know if I'm qualified. I don't know if I can really do this. And like, there was so much doubt. And then I was like, I just need to take a moment because you know how there's always like that thing where they say, if men see like, um, one like one quality on like a job interview or a job posting they'll apply for it but if a woman sees like one quality they don't meet they won't do it and so I was like I need to stop that mentality like if I think I can do it then I'm gonna do it and the worst they can say is no so I'm just gonna keep pushing and yeah so I'm super excited I'm glad to be always surrounded by leaders who want to do better and want to be better because that's what I want to do mm -hmm. um so yeah, that's that's my leadership story. <laughs> mm, that last part, that last part that gave me chills. Yeah. Chills. Mm -hmm. um, don't let a job posting tell you that you can't. Um, you'll probably do it better. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I also just want to mention that although we're talking about leadership in the positions that we're in um, as president, as vice president, as whatever we were in the past, that in no way, shape, or form means that you have to be any of those titles to even be a leader. Um, mm -hmm. You can be a leader in any respective way, as long as you feel that you are making that change, as long as you feel that you are doing your best effort, you're putting your best foot forward, you're contributing, that's what a leader is. It's not somebody that just wants the recognition. It's somebody that is working actively for those people around, causing that change, um, inspiring. Um, and so I know everyone here 
as a leader, whether you're in an organization or not, whether you're in a title or not, um, mm -hmm. y'all are all killing it as college students. Um, you know, you're a leader in your own respective way. And as first generation students, we're leaders for our family. We're the first yeah. to go to college. We're, the, we're paving the way for future generations to say, you know, they did that. They did what? That. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah. Let's see. Let's look at these chat, this chat. <laughs> mm -hmm. I agree, Teresa should say. Oh, you should say. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> wish, <laughs> I wish. Yeah. Um, I was gonna, sorry, I was going to add something and now I can't remember. <laughs> Yeah, I also agree with what Aaliyah says right here, where it's, she says, um, you know, even though some people get super involved, don't compare yourself. Your involvement might happen junior, senior year. Um, it doesn't have to happen immediately. And it's okay to take your time and find your place. Um, so I love that. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. Oh, this is what I wanted to say. Um, you know, just like they were saying, you don't always need a title to be a leader. Mm -hmm. Like, just because you're not president of the whatever organization you're a part of doesn't mean you can't be a leader. There's a lot of background work that goes on. So if there's a committee that um, your organization has, you can be a leader by just being a part of the committee or getting people to join your organization and spreading it around. Like just because you don't have a title doesn't mean you're not a leader. Exactly. Um, okay, Kwaku, we see you. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you found today um, insightful. Um, me and B, we got close through a summer honors institute program for um, high school students, and Kwaku was one of our one of our students. Yeah. And, and now he's coming here. He's here. At JMU. Bye. Yeah. So, with that being said, um, if anybody else has any questions, comments, concerns, um, totally feel free to um, put some more stuff in the chat. Um, but other than that, it looks like our little lecture is up. Um, I want to thank everyone um, absolutely from the bottom of my heart for, you know, being so participative and involved and engaged in tonight's um, Tuesday Night Live. Um, heard that, um, you know, not everyone has to, that there's an expectation to make an impact. Mm. And there is no time frame. Mm. Yes, no sir. Um, let me get back to my my wrap up. Um, so, you know, for any other first generation students, um, I do want to plug a resource and organization on campus that we have. Um, and it's called Torch. And it's basically for other first generation students to connect and feel like they have a network of, you know, people that have gone through the same experience or kind of know what's going on. Like I said, at the beginning of the call, when I found out that B was DACA, just like me, it was like a weight off my shoulder. I said, wow, finally somebody understands, somebody knows I can openly talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, and we just want everyone, whether you're an incoming student or a current student to feel that way as well. Um, so I have, I'm gonna drop that in there. So I put the IG for Torch. Um, I also have the counseling center because you know we're always expected to, be, expected to be strong leaders. And sometimes at the end of the day, you know, we're left to our thoughts and sometimes it's a little too much and we need other people to kind of help with that. So, you know, destigmatizing the counseling center. Um, if you need somebody to talk to, that's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, for my unorganized self, um, the advising center or career and academic planning, having somebody sit down with you and say, this is what a good, you know, organization looks like. This is what um, planning for time management, this is what that looks like and having somebody help you with that. Um, so yeah, those are some resources I wanted to plug. Um, but if you have any other questions, comments, or concerns, we are more than willing to talk to you about those either here or off. Um, and I hope that this conversation was able to broaden your perspective and make you walk away with the feeling that, oh, wow, like I learned something different. Um, and I respect that. And again, back to that feeling that no student follows the same path we all have our unique perspectives, um, our unique ways of getting here and getting through college. And so um, just being proud of that, just being proud that we are currently doing it as students, first gen or not. Um, but at the end of the day, we're walking away with a big old degree with our name on it um, to make ourselves and our families proud. Um, so I just want to say again, thank you so much. Um, and I guess that's 
that's it. That's all I got for y'all. Uh, thanks, guys. <laughs> Not the dog, Sierra. I'm weak. <laughs> <laughs>